Hey guys, once again, it's story time with Brian. Unfortunately, this particular story is very heavily based on facts. This is a story I wrote about an incident I had in a Cirrus SR-22 once. It was a typical spring Texas afternoon. It was 20, gusting 30, and threatening to rain at any moment, but VFR-ish enough to fly the highly capable Cirrus SR-22. A friend had wanted to show me his Cherokee 180 as it, I hadn't flown in one before and I was kind of thinking about buying one. So I made what turned out to be a nine mile flight from my airport to Northwest Regional Airport in Roanoke, Texas. How'd I pass the time you're wondering? Books on tape, crossword puzzles? It really wasn't that bad. At 165 knots, the trip goes by quicker than you'd think. I think I filled up the Gatorade bottle maybe once. All right, you get it, it's a very short flight. I hadn't been flying a whole lot lately, so I was probably lacking in proficiency a little. Between the weather and the destination runway being shorter than I'm used to, I did the best I could, and I, I think it was just good enough. You know, I thought to myself, one-third the gust factor, so I had a little bit of speed, and then I only do half flaps, because I've heard people suggest that before. Somehow I managed to cross the numbers at, I don't know, like 100 knots due to something that I like to call bad piloting. Bounce, bounce, bounce all the way down the runway using every inch of it because people worked very hard to make that whole thing and I don't wish to make their work in vain. I taxi the plane onto a grass patch that's designed for transients and I hop into my friend's plane and we go fly. We fly that Cherokee all over the place. He demonstrates stalls, steep turns, power off 180s. We really give the plane a workout and after about an hour and a half we decide to call it a day. We landed and I hopped back into my Cirrus ready to make the trek back. Clear? I shouted in a very, very masculine voice. I turn the key and it started right up. Clear to the left, clear to the right. I give it a little bit of throttle and nothing. I add a little more power and still nothing. Now at full throttle, it starts to budge, but not in a plane going to taxi sort of way, but more of a trying to get out of a bed on a Monday sort of way. I'm sitting there at full throttle and I'm starting to rock my body in a Justin Timberlake sort of way and try to shake it forward as if, I don't know, another 190 pounds was gonna be the little bit that was missing. As you might imagine, the result was, well, nothing but I looked good. I shut the engine off, I grabbed the tow bar, because certainly I'm stronger than a 310 horsepower Continental motor. Somehow in the process of trying to pull the plane out, the free castering nose wheel had become completely cocked to the left. I grabbed the tow bar and I tried to straighten it out, but the pressure's too much and I bend the tow bar instead. It was at this point that I knew this was gonna be one of those stories. I texted my friend who we're gonna call Hero Tim, hoping that he might be at his hangar since he's based at this field. Tim has everything in the most amazing man cave anyone could imagine. I'm talking planes, cars, more importantly, tools. I texted Tim, hey, are you by chance at your hangar? After a couple of seconds, I get a text back. He says, no, I'm resting at home, having the best, most restful, pleasant Sunday a man could ever have. It's just the greatest, most peaceful, uninterrupted Sunday ever. Of course. I responded, I'm stuck in the grass at Northwest Regional Airport. Tim responds, I'll be there in 20 minutes and we'll see what we can come up with. When Tim arrives, I explain that my plane's become stuck in the soft ground and I can't get it to move. His mechanic is on the field, so we head to his hangar. We read the manual on how to jack up a Cirrus. We take out the tie downs. We insert the jack points and then off to Tim's hangar and we get some pieces of plywood, some tools and a big floor jack. We jack up the plane and we slide wood under each wheel one side at a time and then we lower it back down. I hop into the plane and Tim watches from a very safe distance as I start the aircraft. I apply full power. I do everything I can to try to will this beast to move. Maybe if I can lean it and add just one more RPM, that'll be the tipping point that gets me going. Plane starts to creep forward just a little bit and then after about a half a foot, it's stuck back in place again. I look out the window. I can see Tim's yelling something. Of course, I can't hear him over the roar of the Continental 550, but, but he's yelling something and waving his arms. I can tell he's signaling to me that he wants me to shut it down. So I shut it down. I open my door. Tim says, it's not working. You're just dragging the plywood. We sit there quietly for a second. And then Tim asks the game-changing question. Brian, is your parking brake on, man? I look down and... Yes. Yes, it is. I release the parking brake. And like a Christmas miracle, the plane effortlessly rolled along like a deer in the meadow at the dawn of a new spring chasing butterflies. This is why we use checklists, I could hear my instructor saying as I rotated. I flew home, looking down at all the cars below me and thinking, there, down there, that's where I belong. Not here in a complicated flying machine. I should be allowed to travel in things like slow cars or maybe just shoes. This plane stuff is more geared towards brilliant minds that can do complex things like 
knowing what levers do and remembering that they set the parking brake when they left the airplane. They say comedy is tragedy plus time, so I know one day Tim's going to think about this and laugh. Eventually. Eventually.